Hi, everybody. Uh, just to give you a quick update, we're going to start a minute or two after three, but wanted to do a sound check for a couple of requests from our uh, TV partners. So uh, test one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for your patience and for joining us uh, for today's uh, availability. Want to welcome all the fans that are tuning in on the different Mets social media outlets as well as SNY. Um, at the uh, bottom of the screen, when we do get to our Q and A portion, we'll ask you to use the raise your hand tab to be called upon. So, if you want to uh, ask a question, please uh, identify that uh, on your screen. With that, I'll uh, turn it over to Mets President Sandy Alderson for today's announcement. 
Thanks, Harold. <clears throat> um, and Jared Porter is also on, on this call and will certainly be available and I'll turn it over to him for some remarks as well. Um, you've all seen the release. Uh, today we've acquired uh, uh, really one of the great players in Major League Baseball, Francisco uh, Lindor um, from Cleveland, as well as an outstanding starting pitcher in Carlos Carrasco. Um, they did not come cheaply. We've given up some very good players uh, to Cleveland in return for Lindor and Carrasco. Uh, Ahmed Rosario, who's you know been a Met for a long time, uh, I'd say eight or nine years. He's only uh, 25 or so, but if you think about when he became uh, part of the Mets organization, it's been a long time. The same is true with uh, Andres Jimenez. Uh, they've bo both been excellent players for us. Um, we think they have excellent futures uh, and they've represented the organization well. Um, we've also given up two prospects, Josh Wolf, a right-handed pitcher, and Isaiah Green, an outfielder. Um, we're very excited about this. And um, um, I think the two players coming from Cleveland are as well. Uh, they've spent a lot of time in Cleveland. And so there were mixed emotions, but I think they're excited about coming to New York and Hopefully you'll get a chance to talk to them in the next few days. Um, this deal has been in the works for a long time. Uh, I mean, we've been talking since way before the break, um, really since close to the beginning of the off season, uh, just staying in touch, but it did come to, um, came to a head here in the last uh, couple of days, I'd say starting Monday. So we're very excited to have the two players. Um, very happy with the way in which uh, the negotiations progressed and the work that our staff did uh, to make this possible, led by uh, Jared Porter. So I want to turn this over to Jared now for a few remarks, and then uh, we'll, both of us will answer your questions. Thanks, Andy. You know, just an exciting day, you know, to add, add two players of uh, Lindor and, and Carrasco's ability uh, level, winning pedigree. Uh, that they come from. And, and, and one more thing, um, you know, before we open it up, I just want to commend uh, the Mets scouting and, and player development departments. You know, all four, all four players traded, as, as Sandy mentioned, Rosario, Jimenez, Wolf, and Green were, were either drafted or, or signed by the New York Mets and, and developed in the system. So there are a lot of scouts, a lot of coaches, put a lot of hard work into, into selecting these players and developing these players and, and giving us a chance to to use them in a way to, to make our team better. So I just want to make sure I commend that group as well. Thank you, Jared. And uh, with that reminder uh, to uh, click on the raise your hand tab at the bottom of your screen. I see many of you have, so we will get started with Steve Gelbs of SNY. Hi, Sandy and Jared. Uh, either one of you or, or both of you can talk uh, to this, but obviously when you acquire a player, of Lindor's caliber, give up what you had to give up. He has one year left on his contract, but the assumption would be that um, you would be hoping to, trying to extend him at some point. What is the belief that you will be able to work something out with Francisco Lindor beyond this season? Well, look, we've had one conversation with him and no conversations with his agent. So, you know, we acquired Francisco because of his present ability and the possibility that he could be a Met long-term. There's no guarantee of that. Uh, it's something that we will approach, um, you know, in the next few weeks. Um, but at this point, you know, we felt comfortable giving up the group of players we did for both Lindor and Carrasco, recognizing that, you know, Lindor is only under contract for one year and Carrasco for two plus an option. So uh, we gave up a lot of control for um, short-term control, but I think we're comfortable with that and, um, and, and what we might be able to do going forward. And where does this leave you now going forward? Do you feel like you still have a lot of work to do this off season? Is there still room for, you know, a major top end signing or do you feel like you're going to more play around the margins at this point and, and you've done the majority of what you're expecting to do? I think the market will dictate uh, some of our uh, decisions over the next few weeks. Um, you know, we've 
we feel we've made a major impact on the team. Uh, we're not perfect. And so, um, you know, we will still be uh, active, you know, talking in the marketplace. But I do think this moves us forward quite a bit. Um, there's still some work to do. And we'll see, you know, whether it takes us out of certain players or, or uh, makes, it, um, makes us uh, a candidate for other players. I don't know if, Jared, you want to add, add to that? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think we'll continue to evaluate the market, you know, continue to be creative and opportunistic um, as things come our way with, with the goal of, of making the team and the organization better. Good. Thank you. Next question is from Anthony DeComo, MLB.com. Hi, guys. This is for both Sandy or Jared. Um, you, know, you mentioned, Sandy, that things kind of uh, – started coming quickly on Monday. What maybe greased that or, or helped this down the tracks? What was maybe the thing that had to be overcome for this to happen this week? Well, I think we had to, you know, starting Monday, I think we got a lot more specific as did uh, Cleveland. Um, and so, you know, rather than talking a lot about uh, those, those, individual conversations. I would just say that, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, these, these markets, these different segments of the player market, they move differently at different times. And, um, you know, I think there were alternatives for Cleveland in this situation. And so sometimes, you know, when the, when the competition heats up, um, you know, things, things uh, move more quickly and, and, and uh, you know, come to a conclusion. So, I think outside forces um, or market forces uh, that Cleveland was uh, experiencing probably brought this to a conclusion this week immediately after the break. And also just quickly to follow up on what Steve asked regarding an extension, uh, it seems like you would have, like you have at least some level of optimism that you could have productive conversations there. What gives you that optimism? Well, it's your assumption that we have optimism. I think we do have optimism. Uh, I think what we have to offer, um, you know, is a great city, a great baseball city, an organization that we hope is on the rise. Um, there's a lot of excitement associated with new ownership. I think there are a lot of reasons why um, we should be optimistic about, uh, you know, any follow-up decision that we want to make. Thank you. Next up is Tim Healy of Newsday. Also to follow up on one of Steve's questions for Sandy or, or Jared, what is the appetite for another big addition, a big contract uh, as far as budget and personnel? What's the appetite? <laughs> I don't, I, you know, Steve, Steve has mentioned in other interviews. We're always hungry. Okay. We're always yeah. hungry. <laughs> um, I think that's something that, you know, we will, we will address in the aftermath of this. Obviously we've been thinking about what this move, what impact this has on other things that we might, might have considered or, or might want to do. Um, but I think when the dust settles here in the next couple of days, we'll have a better idea of, of that. Um, I think this deal will have some impact in the marketplace generally. We'll see what that is. And what do you see now that you've made some pretty significant moves this offseason? What do you guys see as the top priorities for the major league roster as it stands now? Jared, you want to answer that one? Yeah, I mean, I've said, I, I've said it early on too. Like, you know, I think overall roster depth is really important. You know, we continue to strengthen our, our players up the middle. You know, we added McCann, we added Lindor. Um, you know, <laughs> always be on the hunt for for more pitching and it never stops you, know, you can never have enough both, both starting pitchers and relievers so again we're going to continue to be creative um, opportunistic and um and see where the market takes us mike puma of the post your line is open hey, hey sandy uh wondering early in the ox uh you know early after you arrived you kind of indicated you were adverse to uh, trading prospects uh, to upgrade the team. Did, did anything change or was it just that you kind of found a comfort level in what you had to give up? 
Well, I think that, uh, <clears throat> I think you have to, you know, have to look at this in, in the bigger picture. So we gave up two prospects um, that we really like, but they weren't part of our, you know, top six or seven. If you just look at some of the lists objectively and in terms of, you know, what, what, uh, what people looking at this objectively would conclude. So, you know, we've said, look, we're not going to trade. We have never said we're not going to trade prospects out of our, our system, but I, I think what we've done is we've, we've said to ourselves and expressed to others that we're not moving, you know, the top handful of our players. And um, I think this, this deal respects that um, decision on our part. Um, the other thing is, you know, from a, from a bigger picture standpoint, um, there are draft picks that are involved. So, you know, if for some reason Francisco didn't sign with us, we get a draft pick back, a pretty significant one. If we had, if we, if we um, had signed, you know, let's say two big free agents, we might've lost two draft picks. So it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a net game really here. And um, you know, we didn't want to give up the prospects, uh, but you know, we felt this was an important deal to make and that given all of the other considerations, it probably made sense to, to do, to, to give up those prospects in this, in this situation. And just to follow up for Sandy and or Jared, um, you know, the, the luxury tax threshold, I, I believe is 210 million. And this probably puts you somewhere in the high one eighties. Uh, do you look at that 210 as, as a, a hard line that can't be surpassed? Well, it's a significant demarcation. I wouldn't say that, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a line that cannot be passed, but, it, you know, it, it's definitely a significant uh, consideration when you get to that level. Um, so, you know, we'll see where we are, you know, when we start, when we start the season. Next is Ron Blum of the Associated Press. Hey, Sandy. Hey, Ron. As you looked at this, did you think about first to make sure that you were convinced the season would start on time? And is there any thought if the season shortened, it wouldn't be worth as much to trade prospects for a partial season? Well, look, we, we've had, you know, we've had the 2021 season in mind and the uncertainties that surround it. Uh, both from the standpoint of, you know, the number of games and, you know, the revenue that might be generated from those games. Um, but I wouldn't say it was a significant factor for us. Um, you know, I'm not sure when the season is going to start. Uh, it's very possible it'll start on time. If it starts a little bit later. Uh, so be it. I'd be shocked if we only played 60 games uh, based on the availability of a vaccine and so forth. So, um, um, I think we're comfortable with, you know, what, what we will realize during the course of 2021. Thank you. Next is Bruce Beck of NBC. Sandy, this deal is not perception, it's reality, but it changes the perception of the Mets as a big time player in Major League Baseball. Do you care at all about the perception or are you just thinking about building a team that can buy for a title? Well, <clears throat> look, um, sometimes perception is reality. Sometimes it's not. Uh, what we're trying to do is, as you point out, change the reality um, and let the perception follow. Um, so, you know, we think this is a significant move for us. Um, I don't know that it should have been unexpected. Um, people do get, um, you know, at some point they get antsy. Uh, this, this deal was, you know, um, took some time. It was methodical on both sides and we, we ended up where we ended up when we ended up. So, um, but yeah, I think what we're trying to do is, is create a new reality rather than deal with a perception and hope that, as I said, that the perception follows. 
Ken Davidoff with the post. Your line is now open. Hey guys, happy new year. Um, Sandy, you've spoken often about how this is an entertainment business in, in addition to the competitive angle. And how much have you seen Lindor and just heard about the, that star quality that, that he brings to a team? And, and was that at all a factor here? Uh, I think it was a factor. Um, I don't know that it was the, the, the most significant factor. But look, anytime a player brings an extra dimension uh, in terms of personality, in terms of um, um, how they present themselves, uh, the, how the fans will react to that player. I think that all has to be taken into account. Um, and he's obviously done lots of things over his young life. And, you know, we expect that he'll continue to do them in New York. But, yes, that was definitely, again, not a huge consideration, but um, at the margins, uh, a great benefit for us. Thank you, Sandy. Yep. Next is Tim Britton from The Athletic. Hey, Sandy. Uh, for, first one for you. When we talked in, in November, you said you didn't feel like the team was one player away. How do you evaluate where you guys are right now in the here and now as you, you look at the 2021 roster? Well, we're closer to one, one player away. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I think I'll let Jared answer that question and get, get his perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, I think we've added some some very good players this offseason. You know, we, we added two today. We added James McCann. I think, you know, continuing to press on the depth is very important. It's a long season, um, as we all know. Um, and I also think, you know, putting our putting our players in a position to, to play at their ceilings or exceed their ceilings is, is really important, too. And you know, adding, adding a dynamic, well-rounded player like Francisco Lindor, who helps, you know, as a defender, as a hitter, um, as a base runner, is, it, it really helps those things. It makes his teammates better. Um, you know, adding a catcher like James McCann, who impacts every pitch that's thrown between the, the catcher and the pitcher, um, is a significant impact. Carlos Carrasco has a, you know, proven track record, multiple pitches with command, who's done it on big stages, um, you know, is a veteran presence in our rotation. So, yeah, I think we're, we're getting deeper. Um, we still have work to do. I, I don't think that work really ever stops, quite frankly. Um, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's always a fluid process and something that we're, we're very focused on. And then for Jared, as a follow-up to that, how, how do you view your infield mix in particular at the moment? Uh, you know, where Jeff McNeil fits in, what you feel about, you know, the third base position, for instance? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, you know, I think what, we're, what we have is we have some, some very good offensive players and some defensive versatility. Um, you know, McNeil can play, you know, second, third, um, corner outfield if necessary. Um, J.D. Davis can play third base, corner outfield if necessary. So we have moving parts. I think it's important to have some flexibility. Um, you know, if you have some positional flexibility on defense, you're able to, you know, make more decisions with leverage, you know, um, over the course of the season because, you know, more players can fit into what you have. So, um, that's how we're approaching it. I'm sure, you know, as spring training approaches, Louie and his staff will have more specific talks with, with those guys about where we see them playing most of the time. But um, right now we feel good about it. Um, like I said, with plenty of flexibility and versatility. Good. Thanks, Jared. Next is Justin Toscano of Bergen Record. For uh, either one of you, as it relates to your starting rotation, if the offseason were to end in a week, would you be comfortable bringing this rotation into the season, or ideally would you like to add? Jared? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think first and foremost, I mean, I'd be comfortable. You know, we have, we have some very good pitchers. You know, the, the, um, the, the Grom, Stroman, um, Carrasco, we've talked about, uh, David Peterson emerged, Stephen Matz, Seth Lugo uh, potentially being stretched out, and then, you know, Noah Syndergaard hopefully coming back in June. So that's, that's, I think, six very talented starting pitchers, um, you know, and, but of course we, there's never enough. We're going to, we're going to keep trying to get more uh, to answer your question simply. Yes. But I, I expect us to continue to chip away at it and, uh, and improve things. And, and kind of on your guys's answer about the prospects a little bit ago to drill down a bit, who would you say the names or even the number of guys you would view as untouchables that you, you absolutely would not trade? You know, I, I don't think there's the, – the word untouchable is dangerous, but, you know, I think I think we view 
five or six guys that we're really trying to stay away from, you know, without naming names, but um, we feel really good about the top five or six players in the farm system. Howie Rose, the voice is next. Thank you. Um, this is for Sandy or Jared, but uh, do you feel I'm a least bit hamstrung from furthering any deals that might be in at least the development stage by the uncertainty over whether the designated hitter is going to be in the National League this season? And do you have a feel for where that might end up with DH? Uh, <clears throat> I don't think anything we do going forward is going to hinge on the DH in the National League. I think our issues with respect to the DH and whether it exists in the National League next year already already are they're already present i mean we have you know alonzo we have uh, Don smith we, we've already got issues with respect to the dh i don't think we're going to um complicate those further um but you know i think that from our standpoint we'd like to see the dh in the national league not only from again from the standpoint of the organization and, uh, and our player personnel now but from my standpoint just just for you know the game as a whole i think it it's time. Thank you. Thank you, Howie. Next up is Joel Sherman of The Post. Sandy, uh, I'm wondering if we could drill down a little further. You, 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 you did dance a little on this. Is Do you have permission from ownership to go to the top of the market free agent-wise still if you want? Uh, and or do you not want to anymore and you're thinking more that what the team needs is overall depth for, and that's how you should use your capital moving forward? Uh, Joel, two very good questions, neither of which I'm going to answer. Uh, you know, what we do over the next few weeks is, as, I, as we've said before, is going to be a function of the marketplace and a function of changing circumstances. And for us to say that we're going to do this or do that, look, a couple of months ago, you know, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the free agent market, recognizing that trades would also be a possibility. It's hard to know where things are going to go. I mean, I don't know what the top end of the market is at this point. Um, so I think, I think we're going to hold, you know, hold our cards and, and see where things go. And, um, Honestly, I, I don't know that I could even answer either of those questions today. Sandy, can I just follow with one other thing and just wonder, instead of guessing if you did something Freudian here, ask you if you did something Freudian. When you said you don't think anything we do moving code is going to hinge on the DH and the National League. If you were, for example, going to sign a starting center fielder, you would then have to move Nimmo over to left, you have Conforto in right, and then you'd have both Smith and Alonzo, and one of them would have to be on the bench. So if right. you're saying that nothing you do moving forward uh, is going to hinge on the DH and the NL, are you telling us you're not in the market for a starting center fielder right now? No, I'm, I'm not saying any of the sort. I think what, what I was referring to is that we, we have the DH dilemma already. Um, and, you know, putting uh, Dominic Smith in left field is not ideal. Um, he can play there and to get his bat in the lineup, you know, he probably will end up playing quite a bit there. Um, but that's, that's not a deal for us, uh, regardless of what we do, you know, at another position. So, um, as I said, we, we've already got the DH problem, but I wouldn't assume that, you know, that DH problem is going to preclude us from doing something else with a position player. Next is Dave Lennon of Newsday. Got me. Hey, Sandy and Jared. Yep. Um, just for both you guys, it, from the jump, was this a Lindor Carrasco deal, or was it? Did it start with Lindor, and the conversations led to including Carrasco? I know all of us were always focused on Lindor and didn't think of it being kind of a a bigger package. So I'm just wondering the the, the genesis of that. If that's something that you guys, you know, wanted to make a point of working towards that that sort of thing. I'd say that, that 
that uh, you know the exact dimensions of the deal, one player, two players, um, shifted over time. Um, I mean, we, you know, I would say the conversations, uh, you know, at the outset, um, focused primarily on Lindor. Um, I wouldn't say that we ever uh, had long discussions about Carrasco individually, but, you know, it was one player, two players back and it really was, I think what was happening to some extent was Cleveland was trying to gauge whether it made sense to possibly trade them separately or to keep one and trade the other. And so I think, you know, we always had our eyes on both, um, but it wasn't clear that, that uh, Cleveland was interested in trading both in the same deal. And, and just for uh, maybe Jared, you could answer this part of it. Is it how satisfying is it to really, I mean, we never had you guys in the market for a shortstop necessarily. It wasn't a top item of need, but to really get a start, one of the best in the game along with a top pitcher to, in one deal from a front office perspective, how satisfying is that part of it to knock off two things in, in one shot like that? Yeah, no, good question. It's great. I mean, anytime you can add a player like Lindor, it's, you know, it, it's the, one of the hardest things in baseball to get, you know, a shortstop superstar um, player in his prime. Um, like we talked about earlier, charismatic personality and guy who makes his teammates better. And, and adding, adding a guy like Carrasco in the same deal, it just lengthens, lengthens out the rotation, you know, really kind of gives a different look in our rotation from the other two guys that are, that are, that are in the top half. So yeah, we're excited. Um, it's definitely satisfying. And, you know, like Sandy said earlier, we gave up significant resources to get him, but we're, we're excited about these two. Thank you. Next is Barry Bloom of Sportico. Hey, guys. Hey, Sandy. How are you? Happy New Year. Um, on your wish list of these top free agents, would you rather have a pitcher, an outfielder, or an infielder? <laughs> I'll let Jared answer that question. Oh, come on. <laughs> they're, I mean, they're all, they're all great players, you know. It's a, it's a good question. But, you know, I think Sandy said earlier, I think we have to take a step back, you know, evaluate the team, evaluate the market, see what comes our way, you know, see, see where the market shifts, you know, like – um, it's not really moving at this point. So um, I think there's, I think, like, like I said earlier, I, I forget if Tim asked the question or, or who it was, but I feel like we're creating, a, you know, a roster that has some versatility to it. We're able to plug different holes in different ways. And, um, but again, I think a lot of that's going to be driven by the market, Barry. Uh, also, you guys, um, when, when, when you look at, the collective bargaining agreement that that has to be negotiated this this year. What are the the high points about signing Lindor long term, or just letting him play out and go into the market and see what happens? Well, look. Um, <clears throat> so you know we've got Francisco for a year. We hope he's fantastic in 2021, and that uh, you know there's. There's every reason to uh, talk to him about some long-term arrangement, but um, you know, not getting into that conversation on this day because we're kind of celebrating the acquisition as opposed to the extension at this point. Um, you know, we we feel we feel comfortable. Um, uh, <clears throat> so we'll see where it goes. Mike Fitzpatrick of the AP, your line is now open. Hey, guys, this is uh, for either or both of you. Just, um, you know, in addition to Lindor, there are several high quality shortstops that come up for free agency after this season. Um, Baez, Seager. Uh, how much did that play into the thinking here that, you know, you had two young shortstops here in Jimenez and Rosario. You you know, would have had access to several all-star shortstops possibly next off season, if you wanted to go in that direction without giving up any young players. And um, just also, I mean, was Jimenez, did the Indians require Jimenez to get started in these talks? 
Well, Jimenez was one of our most popular asks over the course of the winter. And I think that, I think that he was central to uh, Cleveland's interest in making a deal. Um, you know, he's an exciting young player and uh, somebody that I think they can forecast, uh, you know, on their major league team uh, and making a significant contribution next year or the next few. So he was, he was, you know, he was a central figure in this. Um, in terms of, you know, the shortstops that are available next year, that's next year. We're getting ready for 2021. Next up is Bradford Davis with the Daily News. Hi, everyone. Um, you know, uh, obviously with, uh, and I, I apologize if this is asked because I did have some technical difficulties as my um, speaker earlier, but, um, you know, I, with the, the Lindor trade and trading away Rosario and uh, Jimenez, like, you know, some, some of your infield depth ha has been, you know, depleted on the major league level. And, uh, you know, it's, it's from my understanding, the depth chart would have J.D. Davis as starting third baseman, but we know that he has performed better defensively in left field than in third base. I'm curious if you guys see him as your third baseman at this point, or if you're, you know, looking into other adjustments in the, to the roster in that level. Yeah. Well, I would remind you that we still have a guy named Guillaume on the roster who's got tremendous versatility as well. But in terms of J.D. Davis, I'll, you know, I'll let Jared answer that question if he can. Yeah, so J.D. Davis, I mean, he's, we all know he's a, he's a very good hitter. I think, I think one thing that sometimes is overlooked is just the, the importance and the value of, you know, player development at the major league level. And, um, you know, J.D. Davis is an incredibly – um, hard worker from from everything I've heard. We have really good really good coaches. You know, infield coach with Gary DiCarc now, field coach now Tony Tarasco, and you know those guys are going to challenge JD um, to improve his overall defense every day and become a, a very good, well-rounded player. He's still you know he's still at the point in his career, not that it ever stops, but he's in the developmental stage. And um, you know I, we have confidence that JD is going to be become a, a more consistent defender and, and be able to help us on both sides of the ball. Thank you. Thank you. And um, another question. Um, sort of bigger than this than all of this, but I guess um, you know we all saw a you know really concerning violent riot and siege you know uh, in Washington just a few you know just a day ago you know racist imagery all in the Capitol and you know stuff that certainly impacts everyone's lives, including I'm sure everyone you know in your in your organization you know when they leave the ballpark. I'm I'm curious you know where you were when you saw the news, what you felt, and you know if you guys have any plans on engaging your players or organization in a whole on you know what happens next or you know in your response to it. Good question. Um, not within the scope of this press conference, but question that needs to be answered. Um, so from an organizational standpoint, you know, we've reached out to our employees today uh, about what happened yesterday um, to make sure that, that um, you know, if, 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 if there's a need to communicate with us about that, that they should feel free to do so. Uh, my views on that situation and similar ones are publicly known. I've written on this topic before. Um, <clears throat> there's no reason to go into it now. But, uh, you know, I, I've, I found yesterday disturbing on many different levels. Um, and I'm sure most people did. And, uh, you know, for reasons you've stated, as well as you know, many others that uh, come into play and, and questions that need to be answered. Um, you know, for somebody like myself, who's uh, you know spent a few years, um, you know, defending democracy, I guess in some way, uh, not just yesterday, but the last few years have been extraordinarily disappointing. And um, but you know. We have institutions that protect us from individuals in most cases, and it seems that those institutions uh, not only have survived, but have guaranteed our survival as a democracy. So that's my view. Thank you, Sandy. Next, we will go with Ed Coleman of The Fan. Uh, hey guys, how you doing? Um, I guess this is for Jared, kind of an offshoot of, uh, of the question that just took place. But uh, Jared, you had, uh, Sandy mentioned Guillaume as depth, but uh, you had mentioned in your opening press conference about being strong up the middle uh, and just putting aside center field for 
a minute, uh, depending on who plays second and third, are you happy with your infield defense the way it's set right now, or do you have to look outside to possibly upgrade that? Yeah, I think we're always looking to upgrade. You know, I think, um, you know, just because you're looking to upgrade doesn't mean you're going to force certain things or force certain positions. I think, you know, the, the best way to round out the roster, you know, in a lot of cases there's, is, is players who are versatile, um, who are strong defensively, who can play multiple positions. Um, it's, it's easier to plug them into the lineup. Perhaps they, you know, dominate one side of a platoon um, as, as a hitter. So I would think that, you know, we're going to be looking for, for good defensive players with some versatility. Um, does it mean you can force that and that, um, you know, the market's going to come to you? No. Um, and, you know, we, we feel like we do have a solid group right now, but that's how I see kind of the rest of the, the off season going with, uh, with, I think that's what you're asking, kind of the, yeah. the depth and the well-roundedness of the roster. Thank you. Next is, uh, Bob Klappish of the Star Ledger. Bob, are you there? All right, let us know. We'll come back to you if uh, if you need us to. Uh, next, uh, another voice of the Mets, Wayne Randazzo. Andy and Jared, a couple of questions. One, are, are you satisfied after getting Carrasco with your starting rotation right now? And two, you know, would you say that fulfilling defense, whether that's in the outfield or the infield, is that more of a priority right now than finding more offensive first players? Jared? Yeah, I think I, I, we touched on the rotation one earlier. I think, um, I think satisfied is a – I'm never satisfied. You know, I, I don't, I don't think anyone is. I think the best teams are never satisfied. So, you know, we're always going to be looking to get better, uh, whether it's now, whether it's, you know, a month from now, whether it's the middle of the season, but you know, with that being said, we certainly have a lot of confidence in the starting pitchers that we have and um, you know, anchored by some elite ones at the, at the top of the rotation. Um, and then did you, you, the second question was about the prioritizing defense. Yeah. Is that, is that more of a, would you say right now than finding more offensive type players or offensive first players? Not necessarily. You know, I think, um, I think we just need to score runs and prevent runs. Um, you know, I think if you look at the, at the team last year, they, there was some inconsistency offensively and defensively. So I think we'll be looking for for well-rounded players or at least players that, you know, do something really, really well uh, that fit well together. Um, you know, run prevention is always important. So to, to your question specifically, yeah, we'll, we'll be looking at guys who can defend, but I wouldn't say we'll prioritize one over the other. Thank you, Jared. Next is Tyler Kepner from the Times. Hey guys, how are you? Um, I want to ask, Sandy, you've, you've got experience obviously with the Mets now and with the Mets before. Um, what is it like having this freedom to, to go out and, and make a big move like this and to talk openly about how kind of anything's still possible? What is that like um, operating in this current Mets environment um, for you? Well, look, it's a little bit different, but um, every, every you know, employment situation I've been in has been a little bit different. And, uh, you know, if you're working for Oakland, sometimes you have resources and sometimes you don't. Same would be true in San Diego. The same would be true in New York. Um, it's a different situation. Um, it's not really useful, I don't think, to underscore the differences. Uh, there are some. But, uh, you know, we're very happy with the um, latitude that we have right now. But look, still have to make good decisions within the framework of what your options are. And so, um, yes, it's nice to have, you know, a little more, fle more flexibility, but we still have to, we still have to make good decisions with the resources that we have. And that's, that's, that's the focus more than, you know, on limitations versus, um, um, you know, more, more, more options and possibilities. Yeah, and, and you and Jared both have talked about um, what you love about Lindor's game. But I mean, when, when you when you've watched him over the years, and not even thought, I guess, while you're watching him about getting him someday, what do you enjoy watching about uh, about Lindor's uh, 
game and the way he, you know, the way he plays. What's he going to bring to uh, to the scene here? Jared, you want to? I'll touch on it. So um, I, I think the well-roundedness um, of his game. He's a he's a great defender, a great base runner, a great hitter. Um, you know, very charismatic player, high energy player. I think his teammates feed off of that. I think he feeds off of it too. Um, you know, I think he, he likes, you know, playing and performing in the, in the biggest moments, um, you know, as often as he can, um, you know, and I, I just think that he's a, he's a, um, the best way to put it, but he's, he, he never stops looking to, to get better and to improve. I think when I called him today to, you know, and Sandy had already talked to him, it sounded like he was in a batting cage hitting, um, you know, in the background. So it's, he's just, he's, he's, he's a very hard worker. Um, you know, he's a, I believe he's, he's a great teammate. Um, you know, he's someone who leads by example and, um, and someone that we think can really, you know, bring things together and be you know, part of um, the core of our club. You know, I would just add to that, that, you know, <clears throat> there's some, some players that, many players that you watch and you you appreciate um there are other players you watch and you smile and that smile is not just you know a function of appreciation but also kind of a um uh kind of an empathetic reaction to how they play the game and uh you know i think i think lindor is the kind of player that makes one smile. Uh, Bob Clampish of the Star Ledger, let's try again. Your line is now open. Okay. Sorry about that. Had uh, a little technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Hey, Sandy. Uh, hey. This is for you. Um, I'm just curious if at any point with the Indians, did you ask for a window to negotiate with Lindor or from the outset, were you comfortable with just a, a a one-year deal and just rolling with it and see where it took you? Uh, we never asked for a window. Um, you know, what we felt all along was that, look, if, we, if, we, if we're willing to, to acquire this player for one year, we have to be comfortable with what we're giving up for one year, as opposed to making the assumption that this, and, and put ourselves in a situation where we absolutely have to do something else in order to be comfortable. So, you know, we did give up a lot in this deal, but we don't feel given the two players that we've given up more than what we're getting in return, not only in terms of quality, but also, you know, years of control. So, um, so we never made that effort. And, uh, you know, in my history, I'm not sure I ever have done that. Um, so. Great. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Time for uh, two more. Let's go to uh, Mike Vaccaro of the Post. Your line is now open. Hi, Sandy. Um, hey. You've been doing this for a long time. Um, you've done both a number of trades, a number of free agent signings. I'm curious, from the standpoint of somebody who builds teams, is there a difference uh, in the dynamics or the satisfaction of a free agent signing that pans out? as opposed to a trade that really pans out and, you know, when, 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 when both of those things actually work out toward the ultimate end? Well, there's usually a little more investment of time and effort and thought uh, in, a, in a trade scenario. But look, as long as the players turn out well, it doesn't really matter uh, how they were acquired. Um, in my tenure with the Mets before, we had a little better success with trades than we did with free agents. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's a good sign for this for this deal. We'll see. Thank you, um, Rich Catino. You get the final question. Go ahead. Your line's open. Hey, Sandy. Um, obviously, getting a guy like Carrasco adds a lot of depth to your rotation. Um, speaking of the depth, you have a guy in Seth Lugo that has performed well in both spots, starter and bullpen. As your rotation stands now, do you think of him more in the bullpen now because of what you've added starting-wise, or is he a guy that's going to maybe float from roll to roll? Uh, interesting question. I mean, you could say that 
you know, he's more a bullpen piece of, because of what we've added in the starting rotation. And conversely, you could say that he's more of a starting pitching piece because of the depth we've added in the bullpen. Um, so, you know, I think that, I think what, you know, all of us, Jared, everyone in the organization will be trying and, and in consultation with Seth to some extent, you know, figure out where he's best utilized from an organizational standpoint. And then secondly, um, you know, uh, make sure that he can um, uh, handle the innings that, that may be involved in, you know, in starting pitching, but that's all about lengthening out and doing it at the appropriate time. And um, so we've got some flexibility there. Um, I mean, Seth is a guy go either way. And I think Jared maybe is looking at that as at both of those possibilities. Good. Sandy and Jared, thank you very much for uh, participating as well as to all the media there. Um, we will be in touch with you on the day that, uh, both Lindor and Carrasco will be available. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, feel free to reach out with any other requests or questions. Again, uh, thank you to all for participating today. Let me, let me just add one quick, quick, one quick statement. And that is I, I want to send my appreciation to the, to the Cleveland club, because this was a very difficult day for them uh, giving up two players that have meant, meant a lot to them over the last few years. And uh, um, you know, we're happy to have them both but we recognize that uh, there's significant losses uh, to the Cleveland organization. And I want to extend my appreciation for the way in which they, you know, handled these discussions and uh, how we came to a conclusion. So thanks. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everybody. We'll, uh, we'll see you all again soon. All right. Take care, everybody.